Are you also tired of this endless number of chipsets, which often only differ in the support of a couple more USBs and nothing else? There were almost two dozen of them for the LGA 1151 socket. And in fact, only three and a half were actually useful. And the situation is not getting any better. Both Intel and AMD continue to study the alphabet and insert new letters into the names of chipsets for each new generation of processors. Today we will tell you why you don't need top and Z and X chipsets, how AMD deceived itself in trying to catch up with Intel, and why the end of overclocking has had its effect on this. This is MK. Today we are plunging into the chipset hell. We believe the source of the confusion is an unusually long lifespan of the LGA775 socket for Intel. In the mid-2000s, technologies developed much faster, and in the early 2000s, the single-core Pentium 4 with the first version of DDR and AGP came out for this socket. Then, by the end of its life cycle, it got the 4-core Core 2 Quad with DDR3 and PCIe in 2008. And if you add a couple new versions of SATA and USB on top, it becomes clear that for such tangible changes, a new chipset is simply a necessity, and the old ones will not be able to make friends physically with the new 4-core CPUs, for example. And this is when the whole thing started happening. Do you know how many chipsets came out for the LGA1155 socket for the second and third generation Intel Core processors? 13. 13 chipsets for two generations of processors, and for the most part, the difference was only in the number of supported SATA and USBs. An overclock in the processor and RAM were only available for a couple of top end chipsets. On top of that, Intel specifications are more like instructions rather than a rigid set of rules, and often the board with a higher end chipset could lose to a lower end one. And the cherry on the cake, as many as three chipsets out of seven, that were released in the course of the second gen processor lifecycle did not receive the third gen support. The boards with these chipsets were locked literally within one generation, although the new processors physically fit into the socket. But back then, users forgave Intel for these tricks. After all, Sandy Bridge turned out to be a breakthrough architecture in many ways, and many people are still using their i7s of the second and third gen, or their Xeon counterparts. But it seems Intel perceived this indulgence as a weakness. Released in 2013, the LGA1150 socket for the 4th and 5th generation had only 8 chipsets, between most of which the difference was again in the support of some extra USBs and such. And at the same time, 6 of them, released during the 4th generation lifecycle, didn't receive the support of the 5th. Yes, even the top end Z87, which could overclock anything there was. Imagine the faces of people who bought top-end boards in the hope of an upgrade in the future. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Intel apparently didn't have the courage back then to name the socket for the 5th gen LGA1150 V2. But with Skylake, they finally did. This architecture was the peak of the company's audacity. And this is not surprising. In 2016, AMD could not respond with anything at all. The 2-core Core i3-6100 was way ahead of the top-end 8-core FXS. As a result, as many as 18 chipsets came out for LGA1151. Yes, many will say that there were two versions of the socket, but tinkerers quickly realized that lazy Intel didn't change almost anything. And after patching the BIOS and isolating a pair of contact pads, the 8-core Core i7 and i9, formerly designed for the 300 series chipsets, worked perfectly well on the 100. Obviously, when the things are going this way, it's ridiculous to expect some real differences. There were a couple of basic H110 and H310 chipsets for office machines, there were as many as 4Z chipsets for RAM and processor overclocking, and 12 of all sorts of B, Q and H, which differed again only in the number of USB and SATA, the support of RAID and SLI and other small things that are obviously not important to the vast majority of people especially given the fact that the capabilities of the board depended more on the board itself rather than the chipset. It would seem that making it even worse is impossible. But here AMD knocked at the door. The company realized that at the start their new horizons could not compete with Intel in terms of stability. So they chose the right approach. To give users more capabilities than the competitor in the same price range. As a result, even the low-end AMD A320 chipset which is like the Intel's H110 or H310 stripped down of all interfaces, nevertheless had a support for RAM overclocking. The logic here is simple. 
to overclock the processor, you need a good VRM, and it's costly. But memory consumes little. Besides, obviously no one will try to set overclocking records on cheap boards like that. So you can allow such overclocking without increasing the cost of the motherboard. However, this beautiful logic broke the entire further lineup of red motherboards. Once there is RAM overclocking on A320, it means that in order to interest users in the next tier B350 chipset, it should have its own killer feature. And overclocking the processor makes the most sense. On top of that, those days overclocking CPU still could give a tangible boost, and boosting the popular Ryzen 5 1600 to 4GHz could increase frame rate by 10-15%. And in the mid-tier segment, manufacturers already used better VRM, added more RAM connectors and PCIe slots, good sound and other cool things. But in this case, the top-end X370 turned out to be completely unnecessary. A couple of extra USBs, NVIDIA SLI support, these are completely insignificant improvements to pay extra for a top-end chipset. And as a result, it turned out that most users, when building even a very expensive Ryzen machine, preferred to use boards with B350, getting 95% of all the functionality the AM4 system could offer. Intel, meanwhile, was just sitting and waiting. Why would the market leader worry about some small pawn called AMD, especially if the latter performed significantly worse in games? But already in 2020, with the release of 12 and 16 core monsters on Zen 2, it became finally clear that the market situation was not developing in favor of Team Blue and Intel had to make concessions to users with its LGA-1200. Yes, the number of useless chipsets is again as many as 12. But now the logic has changed. If in the 400 series chipsets for the 10th gen, RAM and processor overclocking was available only for the top end Z490, then in the 500 series, absolutely all chipsets could overclock memory, except for the low end H510, while processor overclocking was available only to the top end Z590. And it seems that such a hierarchy makes sense. There is the simplest H510, which supports no overclocking whatsoever for the sake of low price. There is the next level B560 and H570, which allow you to become an overclocker, especially since DDR4 was already actively getting cheaper at that time, and the 3600 MHz module cost just a bit more than those at 2400 or 2666. At the same time, performance gain from such overclocking was notable, often 20% the frame rate. And finally, the top-end Z590, which allowed you to overclock both the processor and memory. Intel didn't take into account only one thing. The new 11th gen CPUs on Rocket Lake architecture, moved from 10 to 14 nanometer process node, turned out to be extremely hot. So much so that even the stock i9-11900K easily went beyond 300 watts TDP which put an end to any overclocking. An extra 100 MHz could easily add another 50 watts to the power consumption. As a result, we have the same situation as with AMD, but for different reasons. If the Reds had a top-end chipset that was useless because of the minimal increase in functionality compared to the mid-tiers, then Intel had significant differences in capabilities, but it was impossible to utilize them. Therefore, most users who built top-end PCs on LGA-1200 quite rightly decided not to overpay for the poor overclocking capabilities and a hotter CPU, stopping at good mid-tier boards on B560, which affected badly the sales of Z590. It just got ridiculous. Stores desperate to sell such boards discounted their prices to the level of B-chipset solutions. It's time to figure out the very fresh LGA1700 and AM5. Maybe the manufacturers made conclusions and optimized the excessively bloated lineups. As you probably already guessed, no. Meet the AIM-5. Now there is not just A620, B650 and X670. They also got B650E and X670E. And the letter E here means full support for the very absolutely necessary PCIe 5.0 for the first slot on the board designed for the GPU. Meanwhile, AMD doesn't even have a single video card with such a bus and the top-end RTX 1490 works just fine with the 10-year-old PCIe 3.0. Hardly even by the end of the AM5 life cycle, which is 2026, any video card will be fast enough to actually need PCIe 5.0. Of course, for a potential RX 7500 with only a couple of PCIe 5.0 lanes, such an interface may come in handy, but it's highly unlikely that such a card will be paired with a top-end board.
but the lower tier solutions on A620 come only with PCIe 4.0. It turns out now that if earlier only the top end X chipset was useless, now two more E's have been added to the list. That is, of the five current chipsets for AM5, only two really make sense. This is the basic A620, which can overclock memory but doesn't know how to do so with processors, and B650, which can overclock everything and has enough interfaces to connect peripherals. The other three chipsets are only for enthusiasts and the fact that these boards were not appreciated by ordinary users already affects their prices. Often good solutions on B650E are even cheaper than regular B650. So I want to believe that in the upcoming 700 series chipsets, AMD will just make three of them, as it used to be. And what about Intel? Surprisingly, the company has become slightly more adequate in the LGA 1700. Only nine chipsets this time. However, this is easy to explain. Intel was clearly in a hurry to release its really new multi-core Alder Lake CPUs to the market, and they didn't have enough time to create so many chipsets. This theory is also supported by the fact that the company has allowed a fatal loophole. Overclocking on the bus, independent of the chipset. For processor overclocking, you no longer need a Z chipset. Boards on B660 with an external clock generator can overclock the popular i5-12400 up to 5GHz perfectly well. But even if we forget about this little oversight, which the company actually fixed in the 13th gen, still, in general, the logic of this chipset lineup was the same. Only now the realities have changed. If the mid-tier processors of the 10th generation with LGA1200 supported RAM frequency of only 2666 MHz, which made the transition to B560 with overclocking memory capability useful, then on the LGA1700, even the simplest two-core Celeron maintains 3200 MHz on simple boards with H610. But the higher-end B and H chipsets didn't improve at memory overclocking. The limit is again about 3600 MHz. The difference with 3200 turns out to be marginal at best in most tasks. That is, the advantage of mid-tier chipsets and overclocking memory simply lost its meaning. As for the Z chipsets, they are again useless. We have already said in one of the previous videos that processor overclocking has died. The days of LGA775, when a 4-core Core 2 Quad could be overclocked by 25% with insulating tape, are long gone. Fierce competition and high quality of dice force manufacturers to milk all gigahertz out of the silicon at the factory. And now manual overclocking can even reduce performance, since it often turns off the high boost of individual cores. It would seem that the Z lineup has the last trump card, the most available RAM overclocking. But in the current race for cache volumes, which Team Blue is also participating in, the high frequency of RAM again ceases to affect frame rates in any meaningful way. So the situation with the chipsets for the LGA1700 is simply ridiculous. Theoretically, the differences between them are quite serious, but in practice, if they made boards with a good VRM on the H610 chipset, and if they used its USB and PCIe capabilities to the full, it would hardly make sense to consider B660, and even more so, Z690 or Z790. But alas, manufacturers prefer to artificially limit the capabilities of the low-end chipsets in order to ensure sales of higher-end ones. Is there at least one logical explanation for such an excessive variety of chipsets? Yes. The fact is that on boards with old chipsets, support for new processors is added by BIOS update. And to avoid a situation when you have a board for the previous generation processors and a new processor that doesn't work with it, you can simply buy a board on a new chipset that already initially has support for all freshly released CPUs. And I would say that such an approach would make sense, say, 10 years ago. But today, a sufficient number of boards already have the flashback option which allows you to update BIOS without a processor and RAM. Just power it up, insert a flash drive with a new firmware, and press one button. And after that, the new CPU will work just fine on the old board. So why don't AMD and Intel implement such an option at the chipset level? The answer here is obvious. Greed. Boards on a formerly new chipset will definitely cost more than the same version of the board but on the previous chipset. And given the fact that not everyone has an old processor on hand to update BIOS, many will have to pay extra for guaranteed compatibility out of the box. It is advantageous for processor manufacturers to make a lot of different chipsets, 
because in fact they are absolutely identical chips that differ only in firmware, and a confused user is a tasty prey for their marketing. Therefore, it is unlikely that in the future Intel or AMD will make it more user-friendly and simplified choice, or make forced BIOS update capability without a processor at the chipset level. The manufacturers of the boards do not help here either, and often the board on the top-end chipset is behind cheaper solutions in terms of components used, and the latter, in turn, can be artificially cut to force the user to buy a more expensive solution. So alas, it is a sink or swim world, you will still have to figure out chipsets yourself. But I hope we managed to help you in this at least a little. My name is Mikhail Kroshin. I'll see you again. Bye.